Hey Planeswalkers, this is Eric again from Bane Alley Magic, bringing you another Commander Deck Tech video. And today I'm talking about a Commander recently spoiled from the up-and-coming Core Set 2020. It's Yarok the Desecrated. But before I get into that, a quick reminder, if you enjoy this video and you'd like to see more, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. So Yarok is two, a green, a black, and a blue for a 3-5 elemental horror with death touch and lifelink. And it says, if a permanent entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So we are playing a soul tie enter the battlefield deck. One of the most powerful things you can do in magic is double an effect. You know, making double tokens or perhaps dealing double damage. Or in this case, we are doubling up our enter the battlefield triggers or ETB triggers. Unlike Panharmonicon, which is very similar, Yarok will double the ETB triggers of all of our permanents. The other version of this deck is Brago King Eternal, which is a blue white flicker sort of deck, and anyone who's played against that deck will tell you that having multiple enter the battlefield triggers can get really busted. Because we're not playing with white spells, we are missing a lot of the repeatable flicker potential. But because we are playing soul tie colors, the effects are so busted already that you only really need to double them once to get the desired effect. When you think about what every commander deck needs, it's removal, ramp, and card draw. And black, green, and blue, respectively, are the best colors for those effects. So I love playing soul tie. The fact that Yarok has Death Touch and Life Link are also nice bonuses. I want to mention that at first I was going to build this as an energy deck, as many of the energy producing creatures make energy when they enter the battlefield, but in the end I decided to go with just kind of a Soul Tie good stuff deck. Even though Yarok doubles the enter the battlefield effects of all of our permanents, I think the best permanents to utilize here are creatures. Yarok is great at making what are normally mediocre creatures into very powerful threats. For this reason, and because I don't have many ways of actually flickering them, I am running 44 creatures in this deck. 44 creatures, that's a lot. There are over 1,200 creatures in the Soul Tie colors that have Enter the Battlefield triggers, and after looking at pretty much all of them, I figure I got some of the best. Next, I want to mention a couple of effects that Yarok will not double. So first, in case you're wondering, uh, if you're planning on building a Hydra tribal deck, forget about it. <laughs> if something says it enters the battlefield with X plus one plus one counters on it, that is actually considered to be a replacement effect. It's the same with Shock Lands. The May ability is also considered to be a replacement effect, so you will not need to pay four life to have your shock land enter the battlefield untapped. So let's get into the deck starting with the creatures. So first we have Fairy Imposter, which is a 2-1 fairy rogue for one blue. It has flying, and when Fairy Imposter enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless you return another creature you control to its owner's hand. So Yarok will double this trigger and you'll have to sacrifice it unless you can return another creature you control to its owner's hand twice. So you can return up to two creatures you control to your hand and for just one blue mana and uh, potentially cast them again and double their enter the battlefield triggers again. So Fairy Imposter, great little addition to this deck for just one blue mana. Next we have Baleful Strix, a blue and a black for a 1-1 artifact creature bird with flying and death touch. When Bale, Baleful Strix enters the battlefield, you draw a card. So with Yarok, you're going to be drawing two cards. Also nice to have a flying death touch blocker anytime. Next we have Coiling Oracle, a blue and a black for a 1-1 snake elf druid. When Coiling Oracle enters the battlefield, you reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land card, you put it onto the battlefield. Otherwise, you put that card into your hand. So, again, with Yarok, <laughs> being able to reveal the top card of your library and either put it on the battlefield or put it in your hand and do that again 
just turns Coiling Oracle from a mediocre creature into a really powerful creature. I mean, that's great. Being able to do that twice. You could get two lands on the battlefield or two cards in your hand or a land on the battlefield and a card in your hand. Really not a bad deal for two mana. Next, we have Lotus Cobra. A one and a green for a 2-1 snake with Landfall. Landfall means when a land enters the battlefield under your control, something happens. In the case of Lotus Cobra, you add one mana of any color to your mana pool. So again, with Yarok, you're going to be adding two mana of any color to your mana pool because that is a permanent, causing another permanent you control to trigger when that permanent enters the battlefield. That's landfall. So with Yarok, all of the landfall triggers are going to be doubled. So that is fabulous value with Lotus Cobra, just adding two more mana of any color just for playing a land. Next we have Eternal Witness. 1 and 2 green for a 2-1 human shaman. When Eternal Witness enters the battlefield, you may return target card from your graveyard to your hand. Already a fabulous card in any green commander deck, even better with Yarok. Next we have Wood Elves, 2 and a green for a 1-1 elf scout. When Wood Elves enters the battlefield, search your library for a forest card and put that card onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. Wood Elves is great, you get any forest, doesn't have to be a basic forest. Enters the battlefield untapped, and with Yarg, you're going to be getting two of them. It's just turned a mediocre creature into a really powerful ramp creature. Next, we have Farhaven Elf. Pretty much the same thing. For two and a green, you get a 1-1 Elf Druid. When it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic land card and put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. Unfortunately, it's a basic land and it enters tapped, but still, just being able to potentially get two lands out of this, you have to include it in this deck. That's awesome. Next, we have Plague Mare. One and two black for a 2 2 Nightmare Horse. Plague Mare can't be blocked by white creatures. When Plague Mare enters the battlefield, creatures your opponents control get minus one, minus one until the end of the turn. Well, guess what? With Yarok, they're going to be getting minus two, minus two to the end of the turn. So Yarok, I mean, check this out. This is Yarok is turning Plague Mare into essentially a Massacre Worm, which is six mana. I mean, it's doubling the value of Plague Mare. That is fabulous. So, yeah, love Plague Mare in this deck, even though you probably never normally see Plague Mare in Commander. Uh... Just having that extra minus one, minus one does make it worth it, absolutely. Just doubling the effect makes it worth it to put it in this deck. Next we have Champion of Wits. Two and a blue for a 2-1 Naga Wizard. When Champion of Wits enters the battlefield, you may draw cards equal to its power if you do discard two cards. So, with Yarok, you're going to be drawing four cards instead of just two, and still only discarding two cards. And you can eternalize Champion of Wits, so for 5 and 2 blue, you exile it from your graveyard and create a token that's a copy of it, except it's a 4-4 four, four black zombie Naga wizard with no mana cost, eternalized only as a sorcery. So if you eternalize this, the Lenner's a 4-4, four, four. you'd normally, normally draw 4 cards, instead you're going to be drawing 8 cards and only discarding 2. Uh, again, that's if you control Yara, but that is huge, that is really powerful card draw on a creature there. Next we have Jade Light Ranger, 1 and 2 green for a 2-1 Merfolk Scout. What are we playing, standard here? <laughs> nope, it's just, this card is just better with Yarok. You know, again, it makes these little creatures so much better. So when Jade Light Ranger enters the battlefield, it explores, then it explores again. So to explore, you reveal the top card of your library. Put that card into your hand if it's a land. Otherwise, you put a plus one, plus one counter on this creature, then put the card back or you put it into your graveyard then repeat this process so you kind of get to like sort of surveil half surveil or you know just draw a card um so with <laughs> yarok you're going to be exploring four times excellent next we have manglehorn two and a green for a two two beast when manglehorn enters the battlefield you may destroy target artifact or you know you may destroy two target artifacts if you have yarok I'm going to stop mentioning that Yarok doubles, doubles everything. You know Yarok doubles everything. I'm just going to be done with that. Just remember, Yarok doubles all of these, makes all these creatures awesome. Moving along. So, Minglehorn destroys target artifact when it enters the battlefield. Artifacts your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped. Yeah, that's really going to slow them down as well, having all their artifacts enter tapped. That's great. Next, we have Clever Impersonator, 2 and 2 blue. 
for a 0-0 shapeshifter, and you may have it enter the battlefield as a copy of any non-land permanent on the battlefield. So, you know, if you just want to get something in specifics, enter the battlefield triggers, or maybe just have a copy of one of your opponent's creatures, great card for that. Next we have Bramble Sovereign, 2 and 2 green for a 4-4 Dryad. Whenever another non-token creature you control enters the battlefield, you may pay 1 and a green. If you do, that creature's controller creates a token that's a copy of that creature. So with Yarok out, you can pay up to 4 mana and make 2 copies of it. Next we have Ravenous Chupacabra, 2 and 2 black for a 2-2 Beast Horror. When Ravenous Chupacabra enters the battlefield, destroy target creature and opponent controls. So let's just imagine you have Bramble Sovereign out, then you cast a Ravenous Chupacabra, right? So you <laughs> get to destroy two target creatures with Ravenous Chupacabra, and if you make, if you pay four mana to Bramble Sovereign and you make two more copies of Ravenous Chupacabra, you're going to be getting two more Ravenous Chupacabra, which are going to be destroying two more creatures each. That's six creatures total you destroyed by doing that little combo there. That's how powerful Bramble Sovereign is in this deck. Bramble Sovereign is awesome in this deck. Next we have Mystic Snake. One, a green, and two blue for a 2-2 two, two snake with flash. When Mystic Snake enters the battlefield, counter target spell. So, I mean, this isn't exactly in here for the enter the battlefield effect, but I am kind of going with a the creature theme. You'll see some kind of creature benefits for casting creatures. Also, if you're playing green blue, why not have Mystic Snake for sure? <laughs> so, our counter spells are mostly creatures as well. Same thing with Frilled Mystic, two green and two blue for a 3 2 elf lizard wizard with flash. And when Frilled Mystic enters the battlefield, you may counter target spell. Sweet. Next, we have Solemn Simulacrum, four mana for a 2 2 golem. When Solemn Simulacrum enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic land card, put that card onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle your library. When Solemn Simulacrum dies, you get to draw a card. Next we have Gaunti, Lord of Luxury. For two and two black, you get a 2-3 Aetherborn Rood with Death Touch. And when Gaunti, Lord of Luxury, enters the battlefield, look at the top four cards of target opponent's library. Exile one of them face down. Then put the rest on the bottom of that library in a random order. For as long as that card remains exiled, you may look at it, you may cast it, and you may spend mana as though it were any type to cast it. So you get to cast that spell and not worry about color restrictions. Um, again, with Yarok, you get to do this twice, and you can do it to the same player if you want, or you can do it to different players. Makes Gaunti from already a badass creature into a super badass creature. So from here, we're kind of getting into the super badassery. You know, we're not just making our mediocre creatures ultra awesome. We're making some awesome creatures do some crazy shit now. So Beast Whisperer uh, actually doesn't have an enter the battlefield trigger. Great. Way to steal my thunder. <laughs> okay, but he's kind of the only creature in here without an ETB effect. So Beast Whisperer, though, is just such a good card. Two and two green for a 2-3 Elf Druid. Whenever you cast a creature spell, draw a card. All right, moving along to the badassery, we have Venser, Shaper Savant, two and two blue for a 2-2 legendary human wizard with flash, and when Venser enters the battlefield, return target spell or permanent to its owner's hand. So just getting to bounce things. You could bounce your own things, bounce your opponent's things. Excellent. Next we have Master Biomancer, two, a green and a blue for a 2-4 elf wizard. Each other creature you control enters the battlefield with a number of an additional plus one plus one counters on it equal to Master Biomancer's power and as, as a mutant in addition to its other types. Next we have Golgari Fine Broker, two black and two green for a 3-4 elf shaman. When Golgari Fine Broker enters the battlefield, return target permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. Getting back those cards from our graveyard. Next we have Pondering Mage, 3 and 2 blue for a 3-4 Human Wizard. When Pondering Mage enters the battlefield, look at the top three cards of your library, then put them back in any order. You may shuffle your library, and then you draw a card. So you get to do this twice with Yara. Excellent. You gotta love that artwork too. He's straight pondering! <laughs> Alright, time for some water. Tatiova, Benthic Druid. Three, a green and a blue for a 3-3 three, three Merfolk Druid. 
It says, whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you gain one life and draw a card. Wow. Super great value. Super badass. Next we have Peregrine, Peregrine Drake. Four and a blue for a 2-3 Drake with flying. And when Peregrine Drake enters the battlefield, untap up to five lands. Yeah, or in other words, untap up to ten lands. Yeah. And remember, when this effect goes on the stack, you can respond to it by tapping all your lands. <laughs> and floating all that mana. And then untapping the ten lands. And then having that much more mana. Excellent. Next we have Obnixilis the Fallen. Three and two black for a 3-3 three, three demon. It says it has landfall, so this is doubled. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you may have target player lose three life. If you do, put three plus one plus one counters on Obnixilis the Fallen. So that player's only... They're, they're going to lose six life, but Obnixilis is only going to still get three plus one plus one counters. Next we have Icefall Regent, 3 and 2 blue for a 4-3 dragon with flying. When Icefall Regent enters the battlefield, tap target creature and opponent controls. That creature doesn't untap during its controller's untap step for as long as you control Icefall Regent. Spells your opponent's cast that target Icefall Regent costs 2 more to cast. So this is sort of like a mini Frost Giant, uh, Frost Titan. You know, it's only 5 mana. <laughs> it kind of does the exact same thing. Keep something tapped down. Uh, the advantage with Frost Titan is you can choose a different target eventually. Uh, Icefall Regent will only, you know, do one target, but pretty much does the same thing. A really excellent card. And again, it's an Enter the Battlefield effect, so you'll get to tap down two things. Next we have Shriek Maw, four and a black for a 3-2 elemental with fear. This creature can't be blocked except by artifact creatures and or black creatures. When Shriek Maw enters the battlefield, destroy target non-artifact, non-black creature, and it has evoke for two. So for one and a black, you may cast this spell for its evoke cost. If you do, it's sacrificed when it enters the battlefield. So Shriek Maw entering the battlefield is going to allow you to kill up to two target non-artifact, non-black creatures with Yarok. I know I said I'd stop saying this. It just seems like too good of an effect to not mention over and over again how awesome this is. And gosh, just moving along, these creatures are all so badass when they're doubled with Yarok. You, this is such a spooky deck. This is so spooky. <laughs> I almost don't want to play with it. It sounds so busted. Next we have Noxious Gear Hulk. Four and two black for a 5-4 construct with menace so it can't be blocked except for by two or more creatures and when noxious gear hulk enters the battlefield you may destroy another target creature if a creature is destroyed this way you gain life equal to its toughness next we have massacre worm three and three black for a six five worm when it enters the battlefield creatures your opponents control get minus two minus two until the end of the turn whenever a creature an opponent controls is put into a graveyard from the battlefield that player loses two life so with Yarok, this is definitely going to kill almost everything, giving everything minus four, minus four. That is just huge. Next we have Demon Lord Bells and Lock. Four and two black for a 6-6 six, six Elder Demon with Flying and Trample. When Demon Lord Bells and Lock enters the battlefield, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a non-land card and put that card into your hand. If the card's converted mana cost is four or greater, repeat this process. Demon Lord Bells and Lock deals one damage to you for each card put into your hand this way. Yeah. So with Yarok, this can get you a ton of cards. Really great card draw for this deck. Next we have Frost Titan. Four and two blue for a 6-6 six, six giant. Whenever Frost Titan becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, counter that spell or ability unless its controller pays two. Whenever Frost Titan enters the battlefield or attacks, tap target permanent. It doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. So, keeping things tapped down, basically removal. Next we have Woodland Bellower, 4 and 2 green for a 6-5 beast. When Woodland Bellower enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a non-legendary green creature card with converted mana cost 3 or less and put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So, we do have quite a few options here. Uh, really great card to be you know, doubling this effect. You're going to be getting three creatures out of the deal here for six mana. You're going to be getting a six, five, and two more creatures, both of which are going to have enter the battlefield triggers. 
really great addition to this deck. Next we have Dragonlord Silumgar, for a blue and a black for a 3-5 Elder Dragon with flying and death touch. When Dragonlord Silumgar enters the battlefield, gain control of target creature or planeswalker for as long as you control Dragonlord Silumgar. Next we have Prime Speaker Zagana, 2, 2 green, 2 blue, for a 1-1 one, one Merfolk Wizard. When Prime Speaker Zagana enters the battlefield, she enters with X plus 1 plus 1 counters, where X is the greatest power among other creatures you control. When Prime Speaker Zagana enters the battlefield, you draw cards equal to its power. So the X plus 1 plus 1 counters are not going to be doubled, but what is going to be doubled is the number of cards you draw. And already, Prime Speaker Zagana draws you so many cards without doubling the effect. You're going to be easily drawing, like, like 15 cards off of this, I'm telling you. Like, Prime Speaker Zagana draws you a ton of cards. Also, a really great commander choice if you ever want to try that. Next, we have Uvenwald Hydra. Four and two green for a star star Hydra with reach. Uvenwald Hydra's power and toughness are equal to the number of lands you control. When it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a land card and put it onto the battlefield tapped, then shuffle your library. Nice ramp and a huge creature. Next we have Tishana, Voice of Thunder. Five, a green and a blue for a star star merfolk shaman. Tishana, Voice, and po uh, Tishana, Voice of Thunder's power and toughness are each equal to the number of cards in your hand. And you have no maximum hand size. And when it enters the battlefield, draw a card for each creature you control. Again, just like a Prime Speaker Zagana, Tishana is going to be drawing you a lot of cards with this deck. Because like I said, we have 44 creatures in the deck. Yeah, we could be drawing a ton of cards because that effect is going to be doubled. Next we have our two token producers, Hornet Queen and Avenger of Zendikar. So Hornet Queen is 4 and 3 green for a 2-2 flying insect with death touch. And when Hornet Queen enters the battlefield, put 4 1-1 one, one green insect creature tokens with flying and death touch onto the battlefield. So yeah, I mean, just the ability to have 9 flying death touch insects for 8 mana that is ridiculous ridiculous value Avenger of Zendikar is 5 and 2 green for a 5-5 five, five elemental when Avenger of Zendikar enters the battlefield create a 0-1 green plant creature token for each land you control and this also has landfall so both of these effects are going to be doubled whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control you may put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each plant creature you control again the trick with Avenger of Zendikar is to play it before you've played your land for turn. Because you're going to play it, get a bunch of tokens that are going to be doubled with Yarok, then you play your land for turn, put a bunch of plus one, plus one counters on all of those plants, which, you know, doubled with Yarok. Again, excellent in this deck. Next we have Runesguard Demon. Five and two black for a 6-6 six, six flying demon. When Runesguard Demon enters the battlefield, search your library for a card, put that card into your hand, and then shuffle your library. Double tutoring is never bad. Next we have Overseer of the Damned. 5 and 2 black for a 5-5 five, five demon with flying. When Overseer of the Damned enters the battlefield, you may destroy target creature. Whenever a non-token creature an opponent controls dies, create a tapped 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token. So have destroying creatures and making creatures of our own. Awesome. Next we have Crater Hoof Behemoth. Yeah. This effect is doubled. Already a game-ending card just turned into an absolutely ridiculous game-ending card with Yarok. So, Crater Hook Behemoth, 5 and 3 green for a 5-5 five, five beast with haste. When Crater Hook Behemoth enters the battlefield, creatures you control gain trample and get plus X plus X until the end of the turn where X is the number of creatures you control. So yeah, let's say you control six creatures, then you cast Crater Hoof Behemoth, then you can then you have seven creatures total, so all of those are gonna get plus seven plus seven and trample. With Yarok, that's gonna be plus fourteen plus fourteen and trample. Uh, that's really game ending. 
pretty much you should just be winning the game right away, right there. Kind of an expensive card, but man, I mean, having this effect doubled is invaluable. Absolutely invaluable. Next we have Terastodon, 6 and 2 green for a 9-9 elephant. When Terastodon enters the battlefield, you may destroy up to 3 target non-creature permanents. For each permanent destroyed this way, its controller puts a 3-3 green elephant creature token onto the battlefield. Yeah, lots of removal there. And finally we have Dread Cacodemon, 7 and 3 black for an 8-8 demon. When Dread Cacodemon enters the battlefield, if you cast it from your hand, you destroy all creatures your opponents control, then tap all other creatures you control. So, doubling this effect doesn't make any difference, but this is just a fabulous board wipe on a creature for any black deck. A uh, really great card for any black deck, and, you know, just one-sided board wipe, and you end up with an 8-8 demon. Uh, yeah, all your, all your creatures just tap. A big deal. You do this after you attack, all your creatures are tapped anyway, right? <laughs> it's a really great card. Alright, moving on to the non-creature spells. Let's talk about some other ways to double our Enter the Battlefield triggers. These three very important artifacts. As we mentioned at the beginning of the video, there's Panharmonicon, four mana for an artifact that says if an artifact or creature entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control the trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. Next we have Conjurer's Closet, five mana for an artifact that says at the beginning of your end step, you may exile a target creature you control, then return that card to the battlefield under your control. So every single turn, just <laughs> flickering something basically. Uh, as they say, just exiling it and returning it to the battlefield, getting that enter the battlefield trigger again. And then we have Stryonic Resonator, two mana for an artifact with which you can pay two and tap it to copy target triggered ability you control, and you may choose new targets for the copy. So this literally copies any triggered ability you control, not just enter the battlefield triggers. Next, we have a couple spells for ramp, only two because we have so many creatures that ramp, so as always we have Soul Ring, and in any green deck you need to have Zendikar Resurgent, which is five and two green, for an enchantment that says whenever you tap a land for mana, add one mana to your mana pool of any type that land produced, and whenever you cast a creature spell, you draw a card. So Zendikar Resurgent all the time just draws me so many cards, because doubling all your mana allows you to cast your creatures so easily, you know? So you, you cast a creature with all your extra mana that you have, and you draw a card. And then that card might be a creature, which you can probably cast with all your extra mana still, and then you get to draw another card, which might be another creature, you know? So Zendikar Resurgent, definitely a great way to not only ramp, but just end up ending the game. You get to cast so many creatures off it. Really love this card, especially in a deck with 44 creatures. Then we have our two removal spells. Uh, again, most of our removal is on creatures as well, but we do got a couple of the classics. Cyclonic Rift, one and a blue for an instant return target non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. However, you can overload it for seven mana, so if you pay six and a blue, you return each non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. Uh, the fact that this is an instant makes it so much more busted. Uh, being able to respond to people attacking you or maybe pumping all of their resources into something, you know, pumping all their mana into something, and then you say, all right, I just say Clonic Rift, and everything just goes back to your hand, and all that was for nothing. <laughs> I like to use this in response to my opponents going to their end step, so then they're going to have to discard down to hand size after they return everything to their hand. <laughs> That's uh, one of my favorite ways to do it. Uh, but yeah, just being instant speed, don't forget that. Always wait to cast this to the last possible moment. Next we have a Decree of Pain. Six and two black for a sorcery that says destroy all creatures. They can't be regenerated. Draw a card for each creature destroyed this way. And it has cycling for five, so if you pay three and a black, you get to discard this card and draw a card. You can only cycle it, though, when it's in your hand. And when you cycle Decree of Pain, all creatures get minus two, minus two until the end of the turn. So you can cycle it as a mini board wipe, or you can cast it as a literal board wipe and draw a bunch of cards. Next we have some more sort of enter the battlefield enablers, not necessarily doublers, but you know, Release to the Wind is our one sort of like flicker spell. 
So for two and a blue, it's an instant. You get to exile target and all land permanent for as long as that card remains exiled. Its owner may cast it without paying its mana cost. So kind of any of your creatures, you get to maybe... Maybe you'd cast this in response to someone destroying your creature would be the best possible time, I think. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, you exile something, have it return to the battlefield, and you get those enter the battlefield triggers again. Next we have Part the Veil, three and a blue. For an instant, return all creatures you control to their owner's hand. Yeah, and this is an instant. So, I mean, if someone's trying to board wipe, this will really disappoint them when you're like, everything just goes back to my hand. And I'm going to get all those Enter the Battlefield triggers again. Really great for this deck, just being able to get everything back and doing it all again. And finally, we have Rise of the Dark Realms. Seven and two black for a sorcery. Put all creature cards from all graveyards onto the battlefield under your control. So, this is a late game card, obviously. You know, you've been having your creatures blown up a lot, right? Maybe your opponent's creatures have been dying a lot, you know, and you've got a full graveyard and you just get all of them back and you get all those Enter the Battlefield triggers again. Excellent. Next we have Mystic Confluence, which is our sort of only non-creature counterspell in the deck. It's three and two blue for an instant. You choose three, you may choose the same mode more than once. Counter target spell unless its controller pays three, or return target creature to its owner's hand, or draw a card. So this is really great in this deck. Uh, but also in any blue deck, I've seen this card work so well in Commander. Just being able to return creatures to their owner's hand, draw a card, and counter spells all in one card all at once in any order that you want, however many times you want, up to three times. I mean, that's so excellent, such an excellent card. And again, you can ret return your own creatures to your hand to be able to cast them again. And what Soul Tide deck would be complete without Villainous Wealth? The coolest Soul Tide card ever printed. So for X, a black, green, and a blue, you get a sorcery that says target opponent exiles the top X cards of his or her library. You may cast any number of non-land cards with converted mana cost, X or less, from among them without paying their mana costs. So... By the time you've pumped about 10 mana into this, you're basically casting every single non-land card from that person's deck that you reveal. Such a cool card. Next we have Path of Discovery. Three and a green for an enchantment that says whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, it explores. So this is giving all of our creatures the explorer trigger, but again with Yarok, it's giving them explore and then they explore again. It's turning them all into the merfolk. Mis uh, branch walker or whatever it was that has explore and then it explores again <laughs> that is so cool in this deck next we have a couple of uh, artifacts that are going to protect Yarok which is really important because you know without Yarok our creatures aren't nearly as powerful so we have swift foot boots an equipment that is equip one and equipped creature as hex proof and haste then we have lightning greaves it has equip zero and equipped creature as haste and shroud Moving along, we have our lands. So we have 40 lands in the deck. Uh, we have some high converted mana cost creatures and spells, so we have a total of 40 lands. Starting with the shock lands. Again, the shock lands are not going to have their enter the battlefield uh, effect doubled because it's technically a replacement effect. So the shock lands are all land types as well. So watery grave is an island swamp. Overgrown Tomb is a swamp forest. Breeding Pool is a forest island, so you can search for them with the Fetch Lands, which we also have. So we have Polluted Delta, Misty Rainforest, and Verdant Catagombs. The Fetch Lands say you tap them, pay one life, and sacrifice them to search your library for a specific land type and put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. So you can search for the three Shock Lands with the Fetch Lands. Next we have Reliquary Tower, which is a land that says you have no maximum hand size, and it taps to add a colorless. Really important in a deck that is probably going to be drawing me way too many cards, so you want to have that really quarry tower for sure. Next we have Temple of the False God, which is a land that taps to add two colorless mana to your mana pool. Activate this ability only if you control five or more lands. Or remember, we're playing Commander, which is a long game format, and if you don't end up getting five or more lands, you're probably going to lose the game anyway. So. Uh, don't underestimate Temple of the False God. Really good card. I put it in pretty much every commander deck, and it has pretty much never failed me 
Um, if it has failed me, I mean, it's not its fault. It's kind of my own fault for not having five or more lands in a game where we need to have ramp. We need to have lots of lands in Commander. So Temple of the False God, really good. Next we have the other temples of our color. So the temples are, you know, they add one of two colors, and when they enter the battlefield tapped, you get to scry one, which means you look at the top card of your library, and you may put that card on the bottom of your library. These are really great budget options for any commander deck. Uh, being able to scry is a really powerful effect. Next we have Sunken Hollow, which is also an island swamp type, so you can search for this with your fetch lands, or, you know, with like creatures that let you search for a land, like the, the Hydra that lets you, well, I guess that Hydra will let you get any land. Anyway, so Sunken Hollow enters the battlefield tapped unless you control two or more basic lands. Next we have Drowned Catacomb, which is a land that enters the battlefield tapped unless you control an island or a swamp, taps to add blue or black. Hinterland Harbor enters tapped unless you control a forest or an island, taps to add a green or a blue. Woodland Cemetery enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a swamp or a forest, taps to add black or green. Next we have Fetid Pools, which is also an island swamp. Yeah, island swamp. It enters the battlefield tapped, and you can cycle it away for two mana. Having cycling lands is really important in any commander deck because sometimes you end up flooded, right? You have too much lands, so being able to get rid of some of those lands and draw new cards is really important. So that's why we have Tranquil Thicket, Lonely Sandbar, and Barren Moor, all of which are cycling lands. Again, they enter the battlefield tapped. They tapped to add a certain color, and you can cycle them away for that color. You can discard the card and draw a new card. Really helpful in Commander. Next, we have Homeward Path, which is a land that taps to add a colorless mono to your mana pool, or you can tap it, and each player gains control of all creatures he or she owns. So this is to help us against our creatures getting abducted, right? Also, we don't have any solid sacrifice outlets in the deck, so, you know, one of the reasons you would want a sacrifice outlet is to prevent your creatures from getting controlled, so, so, from getting stolen, right? So Homeward Path, again, just helps us keep control of all of our creatures. Nobody's getting our creatures as long as we got Homeward Path. Next, we have the Bounce Lands which all enter the battlefield tapped, and when they enter the battlefield, you have to return a land you control to your hand. So we have Dimmer Aqueduct, which taps to add both blue and black. Golgari Rot Farm taps to add both black and green. Simic Growth Chamber taps to add both green and blue. So these are essentially ramp cards on lands. Yes, you do have to return a land you control to your hand, but if you think about a spell like Farseek or something, you know, some other kind of mono green ramp spell. You know, they're usually two, sometimes three mana, uh, but at least they're two mana to get a land onto the battlefield, right? And so this is kind of doing the same thing. I mean, you're returning a land to your hand, right? That's kind of like you're using one mana, and this is entering taps. So you're kind of using two mana to net yourself an extra mana on the battlefield. Uh, and, you know, eventually you're going to, you know, play that land that you return to your hand, right? And so I do find, like, this is ramp on lands, and you don't have to, you know, waste a ramp card, right? It's just right on the land itself. So these are really great in Commander. I have found they always help me. And there's always going to be a point where you miss a land drop, so they are definitely giving you an extra land drop, and that is that is pretty helpful in Commander, because we almost always eventually miss a land drop. Finally, we have our basics. So we have five swamps, six forests, and six islands. And that's it. That is Yarok the Desecrated. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, hey, please like and subscribe. It helps out a lot. This is Eric from Bane Alley Magic signing off. Until next time, take care. Take it easy.